it's, it's, I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker, David Brenner, uh, who is uh, the Vice Chancellor at U UCSD and the Dean of the Medical School there. He's also an eminent researcher in hepatic fibrosis, who I believe met David first in a monastery in Germany of all places, is that correct? So, and, and you know, to be a fly on the wall at that meeting. Anyway, welcome David. <laughs> Neither of us changed our, our, our plans based upon being at the monastery. But let me see this works. So, um, thank you very much for inviting me. Most of you recognize this picture. This is um, UC San Diego. This is the um, Kaisel Library named after Dr. Seuss. And my, my office is here. And Scripps Oceanographic is here. So you have comparable, comparable setting is here. So anyway, so I'm, I'm going to talk about um, myofibroblasts and um, where they fit in liver fibrosis. And I hope this is generally interesting. So I think that fibrosis is a common theme for um, most um, parenchymal um, organs, that the same kind of concepts are true, hopefully, in the lung, kidney, heart, and, and elsewhere. So, so maybe this, this will be useful. Um, one of the things that we have in the liver that's an advantage and relevant to this discussion is one is that um, it, it seems to be a chron all chronic inflammatory or chronic injuries to the liver result in fibrosis. I don't know if that's true in every other organ, but that seems to be a common final pathway. The second is that it's highly reversible. I think that's an advantage of the liver, that y unless you completely um, destroy it um, and, and eliminate the, uh, the architecture completely, it, it has remarkable ability to regenerate. And the third is that the regeneration is determined by at least two cell types. The, um, the hepatocyte itself has remarkable ability to regenerate, as well as these oval um, stem cells in the liver. And that's, um, I think that's also an interesting theme to think about with respect to lung and kidney. So um, this is um, one example, a clinical specimen from a patient with hepatitis B. And it demonstrates the two concepts. One is that um, these thick bands staining brown this is not the fibrous scar. This is actually the myofibroblast staying with act, um, alpha um, smooth muscle actin. So whenever there is fibrosis in the liver, there are these thick bands of myofibroblasts that are accompanying it and we think are responsible for it. The second concept, which is for another talk maybe next year, is that the, the, the um, fibrosis is remarkably um, reversible. So if you remove the fibrogenic stimulus, in this case, if you successfully treat the hepatitis B patient with a, um, a five prime um, analog, um, lamivudine, the fibrosis reverses, the, um, at least temporarily, the hepatitis B virus disappears, and the myofibroblasts disappear. Okay. So, so what are myofibroblasts? Myofibroblasts are a concept that was developed um, many years ago um, to uh, describe both normal and pathological um, changes. Um, it has a definition, um, a morphological definition, and I don't have any as elegant um, um, photomicrograms as we just saw, but, but, but this has been defined by morphologists as a characteristic cell expressing um, abundant um, pericellular matrix and specific genes that will identify it, alpha smooth muscle actin, non-muscle myosin, fibronectin, and vimentin. And we actually use these clinically, as I showed you. We use alpha smooth muscle actin clinically to identify the myofibroblasts in the fibrotic liver. If you do EM, you can get even better definition um, identifying the rough ER, the Golgi apparatus, the in situ collagen, fibrillo collagen production, and, and, and other changes. Um, and um, if you look at all different diseases, and uh, my colleagues in, the, uh, uh, in uh, rheumatology, arthritis tell me it's defining in, in um, rheumatology, it's defining in um, many kidney diseases, lung diseases, it is, it is a cell that's producing the extracellular matrix. And so based on all that and some data I will show you right now, it, it seems like the myofibroblast is the source for the extracellular matrix in fibrosis and certainly liver fibrosis. We can't find any cells that are not myofibroblasts that are laying down fibrous scar in this. So, so because of all these reasons, one of the uh, like holy grails of liver disease is that where are these myofibroblasts coming from? And, and are, are there something different between different types of liver diseases that will determine different myofibroblast populations? And if you just sort of say, well, what are the possibilities? There, there are three possibilities at least. One is that there, there are resident mesenchymal cells in the liver, of which there are two. Um, and these could be the source of myofibroblasts. And below I listed all the um, defining uh, markers in the literature that define these cells. The first is these um, 
hepatic stellate cells I'll tell you more about. They're the, the cells that store retinoids in the body, locate in the space of DC, and serve as pericytes for the liver. Um, and the second is that in the portal tracts, in the center part of each asthenus of the liver, there are also fibroblasts. So these are two possibilities. Um, another possibility that the, has been recently entertained is that the bone marrow can be the source of um, myofibroblasts and they're recruited to the injured organ and they become myofibroblasts in situ. And that's, that's um, accessible also experimentally. And finally, there's been a flurry of interest in this concept of, of epithelial mesenchymal transition, that the epithelial cells themselves, in the case of the liver, it's the cholangiocytes, the, the bile duct cells, and the hepatocytes that could potentially become myofibroblasts. But, but I want to convince you that the, the definition of myofibroblasts is very rigorous. You can actually assess this and say, what, what are myofibroblasts easily identified? And then with different types of genetic approaches, in, at least in mice, and this is going to disappoint David because I wouldn't do these GFP experiments either in patients, um, that, that at least in mice we can then identify this. So the first type of experiment, and I think it's the easiest to understand, is to look at EMT. And uh, there are at least three good markers, all of which have been used, either used by me or um, colleagues in the field, to look at the origin of myofibroblasts if they can come from parenchymal hepatic cells. And the, the, the three ways of doing this are this alpha fetoprotein, protein, abbreviated AFP here. Th this will label all um, parenchymal cells. It'll label the, the original oval stem cell, the cholangiocytes, and the hepatocytes. To specifically label hepatocytes is a very robust albumin. Albumin is very highly expressed in the liver, and the albumin CRE is highly expressed um, in the, uh, the hepatocyte, and that will label hepatocytes. Or um, um, cytokeratin-19 will specifically label cholangiocytes. And the experiment works, you know, as shown below, which has become a classic way of cell fate marking, is to cross a, the alpha feed protein or albumin or cytokeratin CRE with the ROSA26 stop YFP, so that only if we successfully excise the stop codon, we now express YFP forever. And the easy question is that, you know, if you can purify the myofibroblast, do any of them have a history of ever having expressed any of these markers? And so I'll just show you some data, but the short, answer is that we cannot find any evidence for EMT as an origin from, from myofibroblasts, nor can our colleagues have done these sort of more rigorous experiments. Um, this is just showing that a very fast way to identify myofibroblasts in the liver or elsewhere is to use a um, reporter mouse that we developed, which the collagen enhanced promoter for um, collagen alpha-1-1 drives GFP. So in the normal liver, there is no type 1 collagen because there is no fibrosis. While in the normal embryo, the, na the nail beds, the tail, the skull, all, all express type 1 collagen and, and the mouse for us is green. And if you injure the liver, like with bile duct ligation, these myofibroblasts light up brilliantly and they're easy to identify. All these represent cells that are, that are, that are now myofibroblasts. So we do this in um, the presence of a um, albumin Cree rose 26 mouse. We can see here's a myofibroblast. As you remember, there are none in the normal liver. Here are the um, positive um, cells that now let, use beta galactosides lighting up hepatocytes. So you see the large number of hepatocytes, a large number of myofibroblasts. And when you either do overlap or you can purify them to homogeneity, none of the cells, none of the myofibroblasts originate from hepatocytes. So, so they have to be some other source. And, um, there are a whole series of experiments like this, but let me just show you one from another laboratory. Um, what uh, Rebecca Wells did is she took the um, alpha feed protein, so she was able to light up every parenchymal cell in the whole liver. Everything's lighting up. And then she stained it with various mesenchymal markers like thymentin, alpha muscle actin, or procollagen, and she got the exact same result. There was absolutely no overlap. None of the myofibroblasts originated from a um, parenchymal or origin. So what, one of the, um, I think the um, confusions in the literature is how do you identify a myofibroblast? I already gave you three good ways to do it. Collagen, uh, alpha muscle actin, or bimentin. But for some reason, people have chosen other ones. They're dicier. <laughs> one of which is a protein that um, was recently called um, fibroblast-specific protein, but after all this work, it's now referred to its old title, S100A4, <laughs> because it's not fibroblast-specific. 
And so for people would use this FSP1 as a marker of um, epithelial mesenchymal transition. And when they saw FSP positive one cells, they say, aha, it's a self fulfilling prophecy. I must have EMT, and therefore that explains the origin of my fibroblast. But in the liver, that's never been validated. So what we did is we marked all the FSP1 positive cells with green fluorescent protein and then purified them. And then what we did is we did microarrays on them and compared it to all the microarrays in the world's literature and asked them to say, what does this cell look like? And it didn't align at all with fibroblasts. It aligned very closely with M1 you know, um, activated macrophage. So I think one of the explanations in the literature is that um, FSP1 is not a marker for um, fibroblasts, which you probably use the, the S100A4, and that that would explain why people felt they were seeing EMT when actually they're just seeing inflammatory macrophages coming to the site of injury. And this just to gild the lily, we purified stellate cells and we purified fibroblasts. And from the ear, the fibroblasts of the mouse ear do express FSP1. So that's absolutely right. What people said in the literature is absolutely right. But the the myofibroblast we usually see in the liver, this stellate cell, doesn't light up at all. So, so that, that, that would explain the discrepancy. Okay, the second area to think about is, so if, we, if we're not happy with EMT, is whether or not you can be uh, recruiting um, cells that become um, um, myofibroblasts in situ from, from the bone marrow. Because you recruit all sorts of other cells to the injury, you know, you recruit monocytes and macrophages. So, so it, it's certainly conceivable that you could, you could recruit um, myofibroblasts. And this also, I think, is readily experimentally testable. And um, the way we do this is we take this collagen um, one GFP mouse and do a bone marrow transplant. So we transplant that GFP um, bone marrow into a wild type recipient and then induce liver fibrosis. And that's very easy. The mouse does all the work for you. If any of the myofibroblasts are now coming from the bone marrow, you will see GFP positive myofibroblasts in the bone marrow, in, in the liver. If it's not, if, if it's all endogenous, you won't see that. So we did it actually did it all different ways. We did, you know, GFP into wild type, wild type into GFP, we did all sorts of um, combinations. We did see cells. We saw a few GFP positive myofibroblast looking cells in the, um, in the injured liver. But when we did the math, we could only account for 5% of the cells. And we looked at these cells more carefully. These were not the classic myofibroblasts that represent the other 95% of the cells in the liver, but rather they were, were these unique cells that are CD45 positive, CD34 positive, and collagen positive that are called fibrocytes. So, so fibrocytes are a fairly well characterized type of cell originating from the bone marrow that are mono, mononuclear in origin and and develop myofibroblast-like characteristics. So from all these experiments, we would conclude that so far, EMT zero, <laughs> fibrocytes five. So now, we have, now we're left with the other 95%, okay? But so that's what I just keep you up to where we're going. Okay, and um, another um, type of experiment that we did was we simply adoptively transferred the, the fibrocytes. And again, it, the fibrocytes specifically, just as literature said, they home to the injured liver well, we gave these hepatic stellate cells, which I'll tell you more about. If we injected them, they ended up in the lungs. They just ended up wherever, wherever, they, wherever they go. So, so fibrocytes do home, but they only represent 5% of, of the, um, of the myofibroblast population. Stellate cells, which are endogenous, are, are incapable of homing to, to the injury. Okay. And, and just um, to, to say that I'm not the only one working on this, other people in the literature got the exact same results. They were able to show that the CD34 positive, CD45 positive fibrocytes were able to be recruited to the liver injury, but again, only made up a small percentage of large sheets of myofibroblasts that I showed you in the original slide. So, so I think that they are functional. Their, their, their function might be different than just simply adding to the myofibroblast population, but they don't account for the myofibroblast population. So we took a more um, um, generic approach, and we looked at two of the classic models of liver injury. This is called cholestatic, which means you damage the bile ducts, which experimentally means you tie off the common bile duct, and that bile duct ligation will lead to fibrosis in the mouse after several weeks. Or you can cause a, a pyotoxic injury, in which most people use carbon tetrachloride, give repeated doses over a couple of weeks, and you will again get um, um, 
chronic injury and fibrosis. So, so we can compare um, cholestatic injury and hepatotoxic injury and ask the question, where are the myofibroblasts coming from? And this is just what the experiment looks like. Um, here is a carbon tetrachloride induced injured liver. Here are these, remember these myofibroblasts lighting up in the liver. And the other is a common bile duct ligation where you do a laparoscopic surgery, close the mouse, let them run around for a month, and then you see here this fibrosis lighting up. And if you quantitate it, they're remarkably similar. The amount of hydroxyproline uh, of the injury, it, it, the amount of serous red, which is a way pathologists sometimes stain for um, fibrillar collagen, is very, very similar. And if you look at the infiltration of um, these uh, myofibroblasts and alpha muscle actin, there are absolutely none in the normal liver. And then you see these, these um, infiltrating uh, myofibroblast cells in both models. So now we're set up with this experiment to try to figure this out. Okay. There's one trick that we have in the liver that you guys are no longer going to be envious of. And that the, these hepatic stellate cells, as I said, are the major sources of retinoids, of storage of retinoids in the whole body. And retinoids are light, and we can purify them <coughs> on a gradient, or they autofluoresce, and we can use them actually as a molecular probe to sort them. So that, that's the advantage that we have. That it's too bad for you. Um, so what we were able to do is ask the bears, right? Sorry? Especially in polar bears. Yeah, in pol in pol well, polar bears, uh, this is David's alluding to his eclectic background, <laughs> that, the, that when, when the polar explorers ate polar bears, they actually died of liver failure because the, the amount of retinoids was overwhelming, induced acute fatty liver and, and death. Probably David and I are the only two people in the audience who know that. <laughs> and that probably, that's probably good thing. <laughs> good thing. <laughs> so the way this experiment works is that we induce fibrosis by one of two ways, carbon tetrachloride or bile duct ligation. Then we um, had these enormous number of green cells because we have all these myofibroblasts, and we sorted them two ways. We sorted for GFP, all the myofibroblasts, and we sorted for vitamin A. Do you do not have vitamin A? Are you a stellate cell? or a non-astelic cell. So we can, we can then see what happens. Okay, so the results were very different. If we did bile duct ligation versus carbon tetrachloride, we sorted. If we did um, carbon tetrachloride, we got almost exclusively vitamin A positive cells. If we did bile duct ligation, we got a mixed population. Half of, half of vitamin A positive and half of vitamin A negative. And we can purify these and just confirm that they all express GFP but only the vitamin A express the oil fluorescence of vitamin A. And the same thing in bile duct ligation. So we're feeling pretty good now. So, so we expected in the paratoxicity, most of the myofibroblasts, according to what most people would have guessed, would be ste stellate cells, vitamin A positive. Well, in bile duct ligation, the jury's out. So let's do this in a little more detail. For those of you who are not card-carrying hepatologists, the, the stellate cell has been pretty well worked out for since 1986, when people first start purifying them. They recognize them, as I said, as the site for storage of retinoids in, in the liver or in the whole body for acting as a pericyte surrounding the sinusoidal endothelial cells. And then over the last 20 years, as being undergoing this change from pericyte to myofibroblasts. And let me just tell you the characteristics, because this is all in the literature, and I'll go on and tell you more about where they fit in the myofibroblast population. So some of the key characteristics are that in the presence of TGF beta-1, similar to what Jack Gowdy has always showed, that it's very fibrogenic and they activate. Um, they also express um, metalloproteases. Um, they also express a variety of chemokines that both recruit more stellate cells as well as leukocytes. They're also a major source of hepatocyte uh, growth factor and therefore contribute to the regenerative process. Their major um, mitogen is plate derived growth factor, which is responsible for their um, proliferation. And they also respond to other um, fibrogenic compounds like angiotensin II, leptin, and, and others that, that induce um, reactive oxygen species by activating NADPH oxidase. So, 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 so this is an obvious um, source of myofibroblasts, but uh, no one had um, quantitated them until this experiment. So we can then look at these much more carefully. We can say, let's look at the vitamin A positive myofibroblasts and the vitamin A negative um, um, myofibroblasts. And um, so the vitamin A, just as I told you, are classic stellate cells. They're alpha and muscle actin, like all myofibroblasts. So every cell that's collagen positive is alpha and muscle actin positive. There are no other ways of getting 
collagen in the liver. They're Desmond positive, a characteristic mild fibroblast. They're glial fibrillar associated protein. This is interesting because they're very primitive uh, mesenchymal cells, the, the hepatic stellate cells, and they still have the neural markers from originally from development. So if you stain them for glial fibrillar associated GFAP, synaptophysin, nerve growth factor um, P75, um, the, the synonym, there are a whole range of these um, neural markers that they still express, which is useful because you can confirm what, that, that they're right. And sure enough, these are all, all GFAP positive. And also another mark in the literature that's just recently reported that they also express CD146, and that's true. In our hands, they do. So that's, so that's the classic stellate cell. On the other hand, the vitamin A negative cells had none of the markers, GFAP negative, Desmond negative, but they expressed two markers that report in the literature to identify fibroblasts, Thi11 and elastin. So we now can account for almost all the fibroblasts. They're either um, stellate cells, vitamin A positive, or the fibroblasts, vitamin A negative, with, with a few fibrocytes sprinkled in. So if you look more carefully, as I said, almost all the carbon tetrachloride induced myofibroblasts are stellate cells, while in the bile duct ligation, um, roughly half and half. But if you look even earlier in bile duct ligation, five days, then the majority, 71%, are fibroblasts. In other words, as the injury progresses, it starts as a portal injury activating fibroblasts, and then it spreads into liver parenchyma and activates the stellate cells. So if you look later at 20 days, it's half and half. If you purify, now we can purify vitamin A positive, vitamin A negative cells, and look at them in the, um, in the, bile, in the bile duct ligation, there's a major contribution to portal fibroblasts to the um, fibrillar gene expression, fibrogenic gene expression, type 1 collagen, alpha muscle actin, TIMP1, type 2 collagen, type 1, um, um, chain 2, while in the, um, in the carbon tetrachloride, it's exclusively the hepatic stellate cells in the origin. One of the disadvantages is that I, I can tell you quiescent stellate cells because I can purify them on the gradient like I told you. I have no technique to purify the original fibroblast. So I'm always, the, I'm always talking about activated fibroblasts versus activated stellate cells as a myofibroblast population. So that would be something we need another marker. We need some other way of being able to fish them out de novo. So we can then do um, microarray experiments on these different populations. And there are a couple of just looking at 35,000 feet, interesting observations. The first is that all my fibroblasts share an enormous number of genes together, which I guess makes sense. It, it doesn't matter where you come from, the vast majority of genes are in common. But if you then look a little more closely, if you, if you induce liver injury with bile duct ligation, with cholestasis, there are a lot of genes in common between the activated stellate cells and the activated fibroblasts. So in other words, the, the way you injure the, the, the organ seems to determine the myofibroblast um, um, gene expression. Well, the activated stellate cells and bile duct ligation, the activated stellate cells and carbon tetrachloride have less in common. And then another take home message, if you ask you know, what are the pathways that are activated, there was tremendous upregulation of the wind pathway in the activated fibroblasts. And that, of course, wasn't known before because no one had them before. But virtually every um, constituent of the wind pathway is activated. We could then also go back and say, are there any sort of like, you know, definitive pathognomonic um, genes expressed in the, in the fibroblasts, because we never had fibroblasts before, that, that would serve the same function as, as I told you about stellate cells, you know, the, the um, um, uh, mesenchymal um, primitive things like GFAP. So in the literature, there were two. That, that, that people like elastin, they use them, pathologists use to stain fibroblasts, and thi one and sure enough, they're a little bit better than, um, a little bit upregulated compared to um, 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 stellate cells. So, so they will distinguish them clinically, if that's useful. And then there were two more we found in the literature, gremlin and fibulin, and they also were correct according to our microarray experiments. But then there were ones that were never discussed because no one had the whole microarray, that were enormously elevated in the activated um, um, portal fibroblasts. And, and these are sky high, and these are now testable. We went back and showed at least the mRNA level were testable. And one mesothelin, we actually have a good antibody for. And if we stain um, for mesothelin, um, 
it, it stains exactly like thylen one. So, 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 so the, the, what, what's acceptable as the marker for fibroblasts is reproduced by mesothelium in the liver. So maybe this will be clinically useful, a way of identifying the origin of myofibroblasts in clinical material in the liver. And we did this in both um, um, clinical specimens from patients with liver disease, as well as experimental um, um, induced liver fibrosis. So in conclusion, I think that, um, I hope I convince you that my fibroblasts are the only source of the fibrous scar in, in liver fibrosis. Um, and that the origin of myofibroblasts, this is new, so this is, I think is, is worth thinking about in other diseases, the origin of myofibroblasts is determined by the type of injury. So, um, and, and that we did assess fibrocytes. I think they're functionally interesting, but I don't think they're qual quantitatively important in the myofibroblast population. We can always find a small population. We couldn't find any evidence for EMT. EMT, as far as we can tell, does not contribute to any of the models that we used in um, experimental liver fibrosis. And then this idea about um, injury causing different myofibroblast populations, the key take home message is that hepatocyte injury, hepatotoxic injury like carbon tech, induces activation of hepatic cells almost exclusively, better than 90%. While cholestatic injury activates portofibroblasts mainly early, and then as the disease progresses, portofibroblasts and, um, and hepatic cells for the myofibroblasts. I thought it was interesting, I don't know what to make of it, is that the cholestatic model, the bile duct ligation model, induces a similar gene profile in both activated fibroblasts and activated paxtelic cells, as if there's something about that type of injury with increased bile acids and other things that both cell populations are responding for in, in, in a way that I think would be interesting. And then finally, I think we, by being able to purify for the first time um, activated fibroblasts to homogeneity and study the gene expression, that we confirmed um, some of the um, old markers like thylen one and elastin and now can introduce hopefully some new markers that will make this more clinically useful if we have some use for patient material like mesothelium and, and the other ones I showed you and um, confirm the hepatic stellate cell markers like vitamin A, GFAP, and plate derived growth factor um, um, alpha. So I will um, stop there and thank you for your attention. That's a great question. So the question is, is there anything that can block um, my um, stellate cell activation? There are a lot of thoughts on that and, and that they work on mice, but they haven't worked in clinical trials. For example, I, I think I mentioned very quickly that you have to generate reactive oxygen species to activate stellate cells to myofibroblasts, and people have used large doses of antioxidants. And in mice, these antioxidants prevent fibrosis, but there actually were clinical trials in patients that didn't bear up. So, so, so what, I'm, what I'm working on personally is that Maybe that's not you know selective enough you know to check broad anti and, um, antioxidants. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm collaborating with a, with a, um, a company, um, Genkitex in um, in um, Geneva. They have made a specific NOx1 inhibitor, and, and and in mice it works spectacularly. And now we have a proposal to try and patient, but the logic was the same. But this is more specific. Yeah. I feel that some studies showing that uh, in injury models and some disease models, uh, the genetic material cells undergo EMT and contribute to the fibrosis. Uh, my question is that what makes this genetic material cell more susceptible to undergo this EMT compared to the hepatocytes? So, no, actually, uh, that's a, in, in experiment, I didn't show the data, but in experimental uh, biliary um, fibrosis, we could not show that cholangiocytes became. Um, became myofibroblasts, just like I could not show past. I just didn't show it because I thought it, was, it would be too much. But we, have, we actually have negative paper showing that using CK19. So, so, yeah. yeah. So, so the take home message, I think, is that we can now demonstrate, nor can our colleagues, EMT of either cholangiocytes or hepatocytes. Let me just <clears throat> add, add one little fast thing. I think the concept, though, that the injured parenchymal cell contributes to fibrosis is actually a good concept, just that it doesn't actually cause the myofibroblasts does become a myofibroblast. And there's, there was a nice study um, that shows that if you block, um, for example, the, the ability to express snail in hepatocytes, you get less fibrosis. Not that the, not that the hepatocyte was gonna become a myofibroblast, but the hepatocyte releases things like uh, CTGF, connective tissue growth factor, TGF-beta, 
IL-1 alpha, uh, hedgehog ligands, all of which have been shown to induce other mesenchymal cells to become myofibroblasts. So I think that's a useful concept. Yeah, one more question that you was mentioned that the protein test cell can undergo transit differentiation to myofibroblasts. So what people believe that like, you know, cells like oval cells that contribute to the regeneration of the liver or repair. So how you explain that becoming a myofibroblast? Is it like a fibrotic process or it's a regenerative process? Well, I, I didn't address that, but, but Becky Wells did address that in her paper. When she used alpha feeder protein to label um, um, parenchymal cells, that labels oval cells. So in her paper, and then she induced five different ways of fibrosis. She was really very, very <laughs> meticulous. And in all cases, she could not find an oval cell becoming a, um, a, a, a myofibroblast. And, and, and a completely separate study looked at what is the origin of stellate cells and portal fibroblasts in, in embryonic development. This is a study by Sukumoto from USC. And what he showed in two, two, two papers, that he could trace them from the septum transversum into the, um, the um, mesothelium lining the liver and then invaginating into the liver. So, so uh, I think that was very convincing that that's the source of these two mesenchymal populations and not the uh, oval cell, which is the source, I believe, of the cholangiocyte and the hepatocyte. Thank you. Okay. What about the concept, because you've always got the fibrocyte coming in, yeah. and then you've got two other populations. Right. Yeah. No, I actually think that's, that, that's, that's the answer. I actually think the fibrocytes are fibrogenic not by their numbers, which are very small, but by their function. That the fibrocytes are bringing chemokines and cytokines to the injured liver that might then modulate the effects of the, um, of the endogenous mesenchymal cells. So I actually think that's a better way to think of it. Well, my union says I can only work in the liver, so I, <laughs> my, 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 but if you let me speculate, I actually like this model. I mean, and I've compared my um, results with Jeremy Duffield, who has a similar result completely independently, that the pericytes are the major source of the um, myofibroblasts in the injured kidney, and, and, the, and the stellate cells are the pericytes of the liver. So I actually like that idea that you can generalize and find, you know, um, endogenous origins of uh, myofibroblasts and other tissues. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, uh, once again, I'd like to thank Scott and David for some really thought-provoking, fantastic talks. Uh, we're going to take a short break and then pick up again with the first in the series of presentations from the uh, uh, divisional or from the program faculty.